Hello, and welcome back to the Ask the Color Expert podcast. Today's special guest is Jason Everett. He is the co-founder of the High Performance Salon Academy. He has a podcast, Salon Owner Evolution Revolution, and he started out as an entrepreneur and specializing in marketing and business, and also a lot of other fun things that we'll talk about, a performance-based artist, which was very interesting. So welcome, Jason, to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. Yeah, glad to be on. First of all, thanks for running a podcast. Thanks for having me on. And thanks for doing a lot to just impact the industry. I mean, it's, it sounds like, you know, you really saw a need and took it on. And I think I wish more people uh, would do things to better this industry. The mission of my company is to elevate the world's perception of the salon and spa industry as a whole. And I think you do that every day. So thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. It's good to be on. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. So you're, you're a very busy man. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we have never been properly introduced until today. I've seen you all over, everywhere on Facebook, and your events look like the Tony Robbins of the hair world. So <laughs> very exciting to see They're pretty that. fun. They're pretty fun. And I love that you're not from our industry. So I would love for you to share with the listeners yeah. how you came into our amazing world of hair and beauty, because we are a very unique bunch, as you now know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would also say, I always say I'm an adopted family member in the salon spa industry. Like I, I'm an adoptee. I hope that's okay. I didn't come from mom and dad. They brought me in separate and said, we like this guy. Um, so I, you know, I'd done so much work in in the salon spa space. In fact, one of my first ever clients was Massage Envy. And I did a lot of work with L'Oreal and I did a lot mm. of work with Shiseido and Purology and Bare Minerals. And like, I've just been in the salon spa beauty industry for a really long time. And um, so even though like people say like, well, you're not from the industry. I'm like, I don't know, 15 years later, when do I say I'm from the industry at this point? You know what I mean? Uh, but I'm not a stylist. I'm not a massage therapist. I'm not any of that stuff. That's kind of what I think people really mean. And so, you know, I come from a performance artist background. Like I was, I mean, crazy stuff. Like I was a lead singer in a band. I was a, a improv and sketch comic. And I did, um, and I also did, uh, I was a professional ballroom dance instructor. So like, I have a pretty eclectic background, but what I learned about all that stuff is, is that as a performer or as an artist, we often undervalue our talents and we're very insecure about what other people think. And like, we just, we always want to get the accolades and appreciation. And so what I, what I found, and the reason why I think I got adopted in the salon spa space is because so many, uh, so many people see themselves as artists. Like this is an artistry, especially in hair color for crying out loud. Like hair color is an art. Like don't, don't give me some bottles to mix together and try and turn somebody's hair into something better than it was. Like that's dangerous. That's for trained professionals, right? But the idea is you are an artist. And what happens is when people don't like their hair, you take it as this personal judgment and it becomes this whole thing. So as artists, we often undervalue ourselves and we undercharge what we're there for because we would do it for free. We love it so much. Like people don't choose this industry typically because they're like, I want to be a millionaire. They usually choose it because they love it and they love serving people. And so what I learned from having a business background is when I can teach people how to go from being an artist to an artist that also has a business backing, they can fund their dreams for the rest of their life. And that's my goal is to help people add another six figures of income to their lives, uh, take home income, six figures of take home income, because that usually will change somebody forever when they really start to make an impact on the art that they create. So anyway, I hope that's helpful because for me, I, I think that kind of gives you some credit and background of like how I came to be where I am. And like I said, being an adopted family member of the industry, it's an honor to be in this space. That's amazing. And you certainly have street cred with working with all those companies. There's some pretty amazing companies that have been around for a really long time. I, I'm honored um, I, to have them I, on my I, list. I think something that a lot of people are struggling with now is the bigger box um, retail outlets of Amazon and Sephora and Ulta and all of those places, the average salon stylists and especially salon owners are feeling a little bit frustrated. I know for myself as owning a salon for 32 years, the last two years that I was behind the chair, you know, I would have a product in my hand, <laughs> Somebody show the client what, what <laughs> I'm using. And they literally would take out their phone and go on their Amazon account. And they're, and I'm like, and at first I didn't say anything because I was like embarrassed to say anything. But then I was like, they should be embarrassed for doing it so obviously, you know? And I would say, can I ask why you're doing that? And they're like, well, I get Amazon Prime. It's free shipping. I'm like, but it's in your hand right now. Like you can't get it any quicker than right now it's in your hand. And I think there's this perception, unfortunately, that it's cheaper on Amazon. Like they're not even giving us even a chance it's, it's to tell them how much cheaper. it's, it's no. very much cheaper. No, 
Yeah, I mean, I, what I would just, so can I answer what I how I feel about that because I have I have some very strong opinions on that too. Sure. Is I would just say at, at the end of the day, and this is not to knock anybody who's in that spot, is you got to elevate your experience so Amazon's not even a question. All, all that really says is Amazon has created a better buying experience than you have inside the salon. Um, and whether that's you behind the chair as a stylist and having that conversation, um, it's just you need to work on framing it. Like we created a game, uh, a board game I've got up here called the consultation gamification game. And if you have a real consultation, like think about this. This is, a, this is kind of a silly thing to, to talk about, but I think it makes a lot of sense. If you go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes you something, how do you get your prescription typically? Like what happens? Do you know? Like what if you were the doctor? They, they have my pharmacy on file and they say, Are you still using blah, blah, blah? Is this right. okay? And I say, okay. So why don't you shop around to every pharmacy in town? Right. Why why don't you? And, and this is the thing. I want you guys to hear this because I actually shop pharmacies. So I've called around and find out that like Walgreens has the same drug that's $12 that you go to CVS, they've got it for $25. You go to Walmart, they've got it for this. You go to Costco, they got it for this. And I think the problem is most people don't understand. They just kind of go through the regiment because they have so much credibility in their doctor, they wouldn't even question it. It's like, what's your preferred pharmacy? This pharmacy, psh, done. So the same question becomes is if you've created a buying situation, a buying process where you just gently present a product, this is not knocking anybody, but if you're like gently present a product and just say, here you go. They'll default to their normal buying behavior, which is let me scan that and see if it's on Amazon. They're, they're in default mode. You've got to snap them out of that repeating pattern behavior and actually create a high quality customized consultation. I didn't know if we're going to go down this path, but I'll go down it for a second. Is that if you, um, for example, if they check in and they have a they have a, a, a get to know you sheet that they actually get when they walk in the door and ask them all these questions. What products are you using at home? Uh, would you like me to recommend things for you? Um, you know, how often are you using it? Why did you decide to use that product? And you're asking them all these questions. And then during the service, you go, Hey, you know, it's nice to meet you. I'm Jason. I'm going to actually spend some time with you today and recommend some products. And at the end of the day today, I'm going to actually make it so easy that when you walk out the door, you'll be able to leave with any of the products that you wanted to have in your hands. So you don't have to worry about ordering them online or taking care of anything like that. And if for any reason you ever do something, find something like that online, I'm happy to price match that for you. Make sure that it's taken care of. Now, what did I just do? I pre-frame their entire buying experience so that by the time they get to that purchasing decision, they're not on default in their automatic behavior to say, maybe I can get that on Amazon cheaper that they check everything on anyway in their pattern. And they'll appreciate the fact that you as a colorist, it could be a massage therapist, it could be anything, that your experience is so customized for them. It's like a Four Seasons or a, or a um, what's the other one? I was going to say Four Seasons or a... I don't know what the other big hotel chain Ritz is. Ritz Carlton, probably. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah, Ritz. Thank you, Ritz Carlton. That's what I was going for. It's such a Ritz Carlton experience that everything's just there and provided for them. And they're just like, this is incredible. And they feel catered to and taken care of that they totally have a different experience. And I always tell people, you know, you didn't, you kind of brought this up earlier, but like box dye, like I'll bring it up this way for your, your people, right? Box dye versus getting your hair colored in the salon. If you have a problem that people are like going, oh, well, sometimes I box dye my hair and sometimes I come in and get color. I'm going to be really honest with your listeners. Hope that's cool. That's the wrong customer for you. Um, mm -hmm. if, if a $10 box of hair color or $20 box of hair color is their preference, like be free, my child, go, go do box color on your own. I am not box color. I am the Ferrari and you are talking about a bicycle. We're not even in the same stratosphere. So that probably means you're undercharging, you're undervaluing and you have the wrong customer sitting in your chair. You do discounts, you provide all these things, which again, as an artist, people typically do. You want to find people that are not deal hunters. We're not Walmart. If you are a high-end colorist, you need to be providing a high-end service and you get to work on the entire experience to wrap that client in something that they wouldn't even think to go somewhere else and do it. And, and I say that as the nicest way possible of just saying, you got to elevate the experience. They don't even think about it. You know what I mean? And provide an experience that they can't buy anywhere else that they wouldn't ever second guess you or shop you or figure that out. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I want to hear more about your game with the consultation, because in my opinion, yeah. as an educator and a salon owner and an actual colorist, yeah, my my feeling is that the consultation is the most skipped over or rushed part of the service Always. and is the most important part of the service. Okay, so crazy stat. If you ask stylists, how often do they give a consultation? They would say 90% of the time that they uh, that they give a consultation to their guests. If you ask guests that go into a salon, how often do they receive a consultation? <laughs> right. guests will tell you less than 5% of the time they've ever even received a consultation. In fact, in most conversations, when I explain what I believe to be a consultation to my friends that are not in this industry, and again, I'm not from this industry, so I have a lot of friends that are not from this too, is they say to me, what's a consultation? And I say, have you ever been asked to buy to be offered retail inside a salon? And they go, never. 
And I can Never. sit in a salon when I get my hair cut and hear retail not being offered over and over and over and over and over. And the lie and the delusion is that people offer retail and they give consultations even though they don't. And what they really mean is for new guests in my chair, I try to give them a consultation and then I just cross my fingers and hope that they buy retail the next time that they're there. Absolutely. I agree. That's exactly what happens. It's, it's the, the uh, colorist who's mixing the client's formula when they see them pulling up out front and parking. Totally. Not asking them, how was your color net last time? Do we need to tweak anything? How about a couple sparkles around the face? You know, giving them, you know, inspiration to make a change. It's just like, chop, chop, get in my chair. I'm behind. I got to get to the right. next person. And the, the reality is you are, as an artist are focused on what you're about to produce as art. But if you realize that the art is really the care of that human that's about to sit in your, to sit in your chair and that you care about your art, and, and this is, this is harsh, but Again, I call these love punches when I say something with love from my heart that will make a change in you. I'm intentionally saying things that will create a stirring inside you that you take action on differently. So we call them love punches. Hopefully you're cool with love punches as often as possible. But the problem is most stylists care about the client, how they look when they leave the chair. My goal is to create clients that care what that style, or sorry, stylists that create care for the clients and what they look like every single day. And they would never let them go home and use, you know, tail and mane or hair and mane or whatever the shampoo is or pert plus or like, if you want that hair to look just as badass, excuse my language, as it is when they leave the salon every single day, they're leaving with professional products, they're leaving with professional styling tools, and they know exactly how to maintain their hair because you've educated them, you've shown them how to do it, and you put a little basket together of what they're going to leave with so they can maintain that look at home. The other 45, 44 days between visits that they usually come back in the salon are more important than when they leave. And if you're only focused on when they leave, that's the problem. Amen. Woo! So tell me about your game. Let's do it. Yeah. So I'll give you the short version. I'm going to make this pitch for the game. However, if you do want to buy, it is available. Um, and I would say you can go on to highperformancesalon.com and it should say the game somewhere on there. Uh, and it's not super expensive. It's just, it's designed to be a teaching tool, right? So the way the consultation game works is that there's a playing game. Uh, there's playing cards that go with it that are unpacking here. But the idea is, is that we give you nine steps of consultation. I'll give you the nine right now is you ask them, have them fill out the form, just like I talked about. And then you tell them, okay, what do you love about your hair? What don't you like about your hair? Then you say, here's what type of hair I think you have based on your hair type. What type of products are you using at home right now? What have you been recommended? Who do you listen to about those? Are you open to some suggestions on products to use when you're here? Also, here's what would match your skin tone with your colors that you like to wear. What profession are you in? What do you do for work? Because that'll help me guide some consultation for you. How much upkeep do you want to have? How often uh, do you want to be able to like, you know, just style it real quick and walk out the door? Or are you cool spending an hour on your hair every single day? That's an important question to ask, depending on what you want to recommend. And then finally, you write them an actual prescription card that says what the products are and you pack that product up and make sure they walk out the door with that like a doctor would. That's why I talk about these references. And that to me, there's way more to it than that, but that to me is a world-class consultation. And that's done with every guest every time they come through the door. They fill out the form as a second-time guest. You ask them, what have you liked about your hair since last time you're here? What haven't you liked? Most people just say, what are we doing today? Same thing as last mm -hmm. time. Oh, that goes right through me. Oh my gosh. Like what that. are we doing today? Come on back. What are we doing Come today? Come on, man. You know, that's the deal. So again, have you tried any new products at home? What do you think of the product that was here? I mean, there's so many different subtle nuances of like guaranteeing products and having all these things. That's part of it. And that's part one of the game is you try and there's a drill and skill game pertaining to that. And then there's a whole section on what do you do if a guest tries to distract you or create some drama or, you know, they have an objection or opinion. Like my sister-in-law said to put mayonnaise in my hair and it's way better than any conditioning product or whatever the thing is. Those are all in these cards and they come up and you learn how to deal with those problems as they arise. So you can get back to the subject of hair and make sure that you provide the high quality of education. Because if you don't realize that you are like a doctor when you're sitting in the chair and they give you that much authority, you will lose credibility very quickly when you don't operate that way. And then they'll just default to snapping a pick and po putting it on it, grabbing it on Amazon because they don't see you as an authority. That's the end of that. That's the reality of it. If that makes sense. Anyway, you can play it in pairs. Groups, so is the game meant to be done as a training tool in salon meetings? Is it meant to be done in, in, a, in a group setting as like a fun, um, yeah, fun so coaching you, experience? You at least need one other person to play the game because you want to do it in a pair where you're actually role playing and practicing. Like it's a role playing game where you actually keep score and say like, how fast can I get through the consultation and nail everything in the consultation with somebody else? And there's a timer that comes in the game. So you can time yourself and see if you can get it done in the one minute timer that happens. And again, a consultation wouldn't really happen in a minute. I'm just making sure your brain remembers everything 
in one minute that you would do. So we do speed consultations. One of my favorite compliments I got after uh, rolling this game out was um, one of, we were doing a training in Florida, uh, which I know you're in Florida. Uh, we were in Florida and we had somebody's uh, family member that was there uh, in the training that we just wanted to see what they're, 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 they help run the business, but they're not a stylist. It was like somebody's mom or something like that, that runs the front desk. And, um, the mom was doing the consultation, right? They had to role play and do the practice and a, a stylist was role playing with them. And the stylist said, I have to I have to say something. I had the best consultation of my life. And it was from somebody who's not even a stylist. Now that should embarrass all of you. Like it mm -hmm. really should. It should embarrass all of you as you're listening to it, because if that's the reality is all it takes a little bit of practice and you got to get out of your own way. That's, that's the reality. So anyway, I, it can be played as a game for the team. We have a whole 90 minute training session. You can take a whole group of people through it. We run this as a training. It's incredible. You can take, you know, dozens of people through at a time or just two, but either way, it's fun. It's entertaining. And again, it makes something that would be ordinarily kind of boring. Like how do I role play consultation? Most people are like, I'm not going to do that. I'm good at it. And it gives you a game to play to kind of secretly sneaky teach you. So I hope that helps. I love that. And I love that the person who did such a good job was the front desk because that's a whole other issue in the industry. It's the oh. most low, low pay, high stress, high anxiety, most important position in the salon. Yeah. And there's always so much turnover because it's not, you know, it, it's underappreciated. I think sometimes how much, how important they are and how they connect the client to the right stylist and how to book it properly and all of those things. When, when I train Massage Envy, I, I train 26 locations for Massage Envy as a pilot. We help them make $2.6 million in the course of six months, 2.6 million new wow. dollars for their business. Then I went on to train over a hundred locations for Massage Envy. Okay. Over the course of the next three years. Um, and we got crazy results through that whole process. And um, want to hear something interesting? The highest performing Massage Envy in their group had a salon front desk manager who was getting paid $135,000 a year. Nice. Why would you do that? Because that salon was making $3 million a year and they realized that was the most important position from a sales perspective on driving their revenue was the front desk manager. Most people don't think that way. They're like, can I get somebody fresh out of high school to sit at the front desk and occasionally answer the phones because they're cheap? Well, if you're cheap with your front desk person, you're going to be cheap with other things in your area. And again, this ain't Walmart. We're not, we're not running a business like that. We are genuinely running a business to help and serve the guest. And if the guest leaves without retail product, we didn't serve them properly. Absolutely. My opinion, my opinion. And especially what if you, you colored their hair and you want their color to stay strong, please don't send them home to use Vidalsis or well, what I was going to say. I was going to say Vidalsis. I meant, well, I meant uh, Pert Plus or some other, or uh, Herbal Essence. That's what I was trying to say. Sorry oh, for yeah. Dallas soon. I hope. Well, here, here's a funny theory that I, I noticed in the salon, and you'll laugh at this, but if this is the God's honest truth. You know, you ask a client, why are you not bringing, you know, here's what I want you to take home. Oh, no, I'm, I, I don't want to buy any retail today. I have to buy it at the supermarket. And then we tell them, you know, how strong it is and how much detergent and the color is going to strip and yada, yada. And they said, my husband looks at my receipt when I go to the salon and he looks at my receipt at the grocery store. And when I get my shampoo at the grocery store, he doesn't say anything because I'm not spending any extra money because it's a necessity. And the salon, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what women have to deal with. I would problem. never think about that. Well, so what issue. I would say is you said something that's really interesting and hope it's okay that I, I give you some feedback on this is that what you want to do instead of telling them anything is ask them questions. And again, yeah. you get to it where, and that's part of how the game teaches, right? Is that when somebody says like, um, well, I have to buy it at the grocery store. You're like, well, why, why do you buy it at the grocery store? And you had the answer, which was that my husband doesn't look at this receipt and whatever. And that's again, different problem. I, you know, I would say, well, look, um, your husband lets you pay this much to have your hair cut, correct? Right. To have your hair cut and colored and do all these things. Um, would your husband like to make sure that that color stays in and looking as good as long as humanly possible? Because what you're really trying to do is you're trying to identify the real problem. The real problem is not that the husband says, buy the thing at the grocery store. That's the symptom. The problem is that the husband is monitoring expenses in that specific scenario. And I don't know what, whatever, we're in a different world. I think sometimes <laughs> and I'll just say it that way. My wife doesn't run her shampoo purchases by me. Um, just to clarify in my household, how that works. However, what I would say is you now are appealing to a very different problem. The problem is 
am I getting value? And this is really important. Am I getting value for what I've paid for? And the problem is the husband doesn't perceive value from the salon purchase, but does from the grocery store purchase or sees it as a necessity versus et cetera. But if you're able to say, you know, things like, well, I just want to make sure you know that your color will actually last longer if you use professional products and it'll extend the life of it because you now have an outside decision maker, husband at home, who's also weighing on the purchase. And the problem is no matter what you say to that person who's sitting in your chair, they um, have an outside, there's another decision maker. So you have to now, now you're not just selling to the person in the chair, you're selling to the person in the chair and their family member that's having this issue. And it could go the other way. Maybe the wife controls the purchasing. It could go the other way too. But you got to understand that that's the conversation you're having. And until you've role played and practiced that, you won't do it. This is the last thing I'll say about it. I say last thing. Ha ha. I'm sure I got 20 more things to say. <laughs> oh, now I lost my train of thought on a joke. Um, what I was going to say is, oh crap. It already lost me. I'll get back to it. it I, I teased everybody with this big thing I was going to say, and I didn't say it. I'll get back to it. I'll, it'll hit me again. It'll come back. What, <laughs> what do you see? Like for me, the last, I would say, especially last two years, and really not even, I don't even want to talk about, I'm so sick of talking about COVID and the lockdown and all the other things. I really try to avoid that conversation, but the whole industry has been rocked and turned upside down. And it, there's a lot, a lot of changes what do you as a coach see for the future as the next trend being, you know, the, the last year it's, you know, people running in droves from commission salons into solo suites. I'm starting to see it turn around where they're looking to get back into being with other people and being in more community. What do you think about that? hundred uh, percent. And I remember what I was going to say. So I'm going to answer the last question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say is not only is it an outside decision maker, but it's also uh, the last thing I want to say is that the, the biggest problem is that you've had one client tell that to you and you now believe that that's every client who sits in your chair has the the husband who is going to say that. That's, I mean, exactly. honestly, even like what you just said, Elaine, like if one person says that to you, it is not everybody in your salon. That was one person. So the best thing you can say to yourself is this is an isolated incident only pertaining to this guest. I will not make this everybody's problem. And again, as a service provider, you typically make one person's problem, everybody's problem. If one person can't afford it, everybody can't afford it. If one person says, I don't like when you sell me something, you've now made everybody doesn't like to sell you something. So I just want to make sure I drop that point. I know I, 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 I teased it. I let you ask another question, but thank you for letting me go back to it. And I will answer this question about people leaving commission salons. We are actually finding people are massively going back to commission salons now. Um, that's what we're seeing inside of our world. And, um, this is going to be a really interesting thing to say, though. I see people massively leaving poor operating commission salons and massively being attracted to well operating commission salons. Oof. Um, it's my belief that we are in a massive leadership shortage in America right now. And I don't care which of our recent presidents you like or don't like, um, we are in a leadership deficit in this country. Both, both previous presidents. Can I just say it that way? Um, mm -hmm. We are in a world that doesn't understand what leadership is like. And we are in a world where people believe you should just do something because I said so, damn it, no matter what. And um, I think that we have, as a industry of the salon spa industry, I do say we, because I'm adopted in this space. We have done a very poor job of upgrading our leadership skill to adjust for what people wanted. We were talking about that before. The reason why our podcast initially was called the Salon Under Evolution Revolution, by the way, new podcast name is Salon Profitable Salon Owner. Just, just we've just updated it. Oh, we, okay. Good to we know. just updated it. Uh, I released a book called Profitable Salon Owner. You can go get it on Amazon. Um, or if you DM me, I'll send you a free copy. It's you can get a free digital copy if you want. But our podcast is now called Profitable Salon Owner. The reason why we called it the Salon Owner Evolution Revolution, our first podcast, was because even before the pandemic, we were educating people that there was a massive leadership shortage. And then COVID compounded the problem. And people were like, hey, nobody's leading me. I'm basically leading myself. I'm out. I'm out of here. Screw this. They're panicking just as much as I am. I might as well lead myself. But the salon owners that led well through the pandemic, the salon owners that led well on the other side, that doubled down on their coaching, that created better opportunities, that helped them make more money. Like I always tell salon owners, if you do not have six-figure take-home earners inside your salon, you are part of the problem. And a lot of salon owners are like, 
what do you mean? I've never even taken home six figures as a stylist. I'm like, well, that's part of the problem. You that's need to elevate problem, yourself yeah. and elevate the stylists that are there because if we can create six figure take home earners inside the salon spa, we will elevate the world's perception of the salon spa industry. And that mom and that dad, when they sit down with that student and they say, I want to go to beauty college instead of go to regular college, that mom and dad don't go, sweetheart, you can only make 30 grand a year doing that. Don't ever do it. Well, BS, I call BS on that. We have people who make $100,000 a year take home. We actually had a salon who said they had two, two, $200,000 W-2 earners um, in our academy this year because that is the income opportunity that's there. They're making more than doctors, lawyers, and attorneys in some cases inside the salon spa industry. And that's what will elevate the perception of the industry is when we realize this industry can make money. We do report all the take-home income, including tips on their W-2s, and we can change the world's perception of what is done all of a sudden, now people want to flood back into commission salons because they realize they can make more money in a commission salon than they can as a renter. Now, if you're a renter and you're like, I left, it's probably because there was a crappy owner there. And like, I can lead myself yeah. better. I don't fault you for that. But I would say if you were working in a salon and spa that can make you double the income that you could make as a renter right now, would that be appealing and give you the freedom to work when you wanted to work based on your income and availability? That's the type of leadership we need inside salons and spas. And those leaders are having no issues recruiting, no issues taking care of, uh, like finding people. And they have incredible salons that make the owner money and the staff a lot of money. Amazing. I actually spoke to someone from a beauty school yesterday, and I was thrilled to hear they're getting record enrollment in beauty school. And I've read recently with, you know, with all the the chat AI robots and everything, they're like, nobody's going to go to college anymore because- you can write, we were messing around with it the other night. We had the kids over for my husband's birthday and we're like, write me a term paper on Grapes of Wrath. And it was like, mm -hmm. you know, so the but world's you can't changing. Say, and color my hair from this degree to that degree. That We're not there yet. And I think we're a ways off. That's not coming anytime soon. Yes, so we should thank, be okay. Thank Elon goodness. Musk is not yeah, coming for your hairstylist. And the Floby didn't catch us. I was a little nervous with the Floby, right? When, Somehow when the, the Floby didn't catch on. I don't to the know vacuum why. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think at the end of the day, I think we're going to have technology enhancements that go along with it. I think you're going to start to see things like apps, and I, I've already seen them over and over again, apps that like you can digitally try on hairstyles, you can change your hair color, and then they spit out color formulas. I mean, there's some really cool stuff that's coming out from a tech that will make your life a heck of a lot easier, and you won't have to remember as much as you did. If you imagine like what the cell phone did for people who used to remember everybody's phone number, and now all of a sudden... I don't know anybody's phone number except for my wife. You know what I mean? Like that's a totally exactly. different experience. Um, but I think technology is a huge advantage. And I think this industry is going to be way behind a technology takeover curve uh, for a long time coming. I mean, I've seen technology, even in my book, I talk about, you know, uh, front uh, uh, reception list, receptionist left. What am I trying to say? Front desk without receptionist. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say it fair right. here. But I've seen digital receptionists and things like that. I think those are some good things. But again, the question becomes, what type of experience are you trying to create? Are you trying to create the same experience that Walmart has in their self-checkout? Well, guess what? Now they're going to shop on Amazon. And again, wrong customer in your salon, which is why I talk so heavily about making sure you get the right customers in the first place. There are people looking for that high-end experience. And if you have customers who are chronically telling you charge too much, you either need to change your prices or you need to change your clients. And I think you should change your clients because there's still, there's plenty of room out there for clients who are willing to pay for amazing services. Absolutely. Well, you are a bundle of knowledge and a bundle of energy. <laughs> this has been amazing. My gosh, people are probably like trying to pull over to write things down. I hope, um, I, hope so I didn't how cause can people any accidents. Get more of you? Yeah. No, no, no. How can people reach you and get more of you and learn yeah, more about I mean, your game? Here's what I would just say. We have tons of free resources and I, I don't ever, you know, I, I always want people to know my goal is always to make you money before I ever take a dollar from you. So is that clear? Like, and if you spend a dollar with me, I want you to make five or 10 back. So if you spend $10, let's make hundreds. If you make, if you spend thousands, let's make you a hundred thousand. Like, let's do that. Let's, let's play that game. So I have a million free resources are very inexpensive. If you want to get our profitable salon or book, go check it out on Amazon. If you want to get our, our uh, consultation gamification, go to highperformancesalon.com. There's a ton of other really cool resources there. But if you just want some free information, you want to ask questions and actually have me answer it, go to our profitable salon owner Facebook group. All you have to do is search profitable salon owner on Facebook and you'll see we have one of the biggest groups that exists on there. Um, that if you're a salon owner and, and predominantly a salon owner with a team, that's why we usually help. Um, you can apply to join we don't let everybody in, but if you apply to join, we give you tons of free resources. You can go on YouTube, you can go on 
TikTok or for crying out loud, I don't know, you go find me somewhere. I probably got some videos there and they're all free. Um, I just feel like if I can help you make money for free, um, you'll come back to me and enjoy it. Think of it like, you know, if you take care of a guest the first time they sit in their chair, they'll come back over and over and over again for years and years in the future. That's what I believe too. Amazing. Thank you so much. It's been an oh. absolute pleasure. Thanks for having and me on. Thank You're a blast. you everyone for listening. We'll hear, we'll see you on the next one. Great job. Thanks guys.